Hello chemistry people, what I have for us today is a teaching resource on chapter 4.5 of SL and that is about metallic bonding. So let's start like we always do by looking at the study guide. Oh, a quick thing that might be helpful as we're watching this, as you're watching this video, is if you have a sample of metal. So whether that you go and steal a paper clip from somewhere, or you've got, we're going to be trying to bend it. So maybe not like your nan silver, but a paper clip or a metal ruler or like um, a staple or a nail, anything that you can sort of be looking at. So when we discuss the properties of metals, you've got some sort of form of reference. So we are going to be talking about what metallic bonds are, how strong metallic bonds are, but that is also going to be in another video. So I am going to be talking about it a little bit now, but I'm going to be talking about it again later. Um, and I'm going to be talking about what alloys are. I'm going to exp be explaining what electrical conductivity and malleability are. I'm going to talk about trends in boiling, in boiling uh, sorry, melting points. But again, that is going to form part of what I'm speaking about in this other video I'm going to make. And I'm going to talk about why alloys are different. I'm only going to be talking about S&P blocks and I'm going to give examples of two of the main types of alloy. So we've talked about lattices before. It is that organized 3D structure. But in a metal, what we see is Instead of alternating positive and negative charges, what we see is this repeating organized structure. That is what a lattice is. And it is all cations in this lattice. It is all cations. And what happens is my electrons are delocalized. So delocalized literally means without a location. So these electrons, I am going to actually just pause my recording and then once I've drawn all my electrons, I'll come back. Excuse me a tick. So these guys are delocalized electrons. You will normally hear, hear it described as a sea of delocalized electrons. So the cations sort of float in this sea of delocalized electrons, like croutons float in a soup. Or like if you see a group of parents down the park and there are kids running around, each of those kids originally came from one parent, but the parents are just sitting there and having the kids run around. It's really hard to identify which kid belongs to which parent. In the same way, in my lattice, I can't tell which electron came from which metal cation. So we normally have it described as a sea of delocalized electrons with metal cations. Now, the number of those electrons will depend on the charge that that metal cation takes. So this is the structure of that metallic lattice. And just like with our ionic lattices, when we talk about what holds a metal together, Again, it comes down to the attractions between positives and negatives. Remember that key term, elect electrostatic attraction. 
So that electrostatic attraction, that attraction between the positively charged metal cations and the negatively charged electrons, that is what holds this lattice together. Now, we will talk more about how strong metals are in the other video I'm going to make. But odds are you can only name one metal that is a liquid, and that is mercury. That is the only metal that is a liquid at standard room temperature. There is, however, a metal that is sometimes a liquid at Australian room temperatures, and that is gallium. And that has a melting point of about, I want to say um, 40 degrees. Oh, sorry, not 40%, 40 degrees C. I don't have my phone on me, so I can't Google the exact number. But I think gallium melts at about 40 it's just warm enough that I don't think it quite melts in your hand, but it's close. So this metallic lattice is quite strong. So the metallic lattice is quite a strong structure and that is because this electrostatic attraction is quite strong. So metallic lattice, I think I accidentally did that slide twice. I don't think I intended to do it that way. So let's, because I can't be bothered redrawing, let's grab this. Okay, sorry about that. I just had some shenanigans with getting one note to copy things properly. Okay, so, let me just delete out my electrostatic attractions for a minute. Let me just pop this cation and that electron back. So cation and electron. Okay, so I asked you guys if you could grab a piece of something metal. So you know, even if you don't have one of those guys in front of you, hopefully you should know Sorry, excuse me a sec. Okay, so yes, sorry, my apologies. So even if you don't have a piece of metal in front of you, you should still know that metals are malleable. Now, Malleable has a specific meaning. So a mallet is a type of hammer. If something is malleable, it is able to be hammered. So it is able to be shaped by banging it. So if you've got a nail, you could, in theory, I wouldn't recommend doing it to a table just in case somebody's parents get cranky at me. You could, in theory, hit that with a hammer and bend the metal. If you've got, I don't know, um, a paper clip, you can bend that with the force of your hand. So it's able to be bent or hammered into shape. Another thing that metals do is that they are what is called ductile. And that is able to be stretched into wires. They also conduct heat well. They conduct electricity. And they generally, oh, it'd be good if I could write the letter Y, have high melting points and boiling points. So 
In the Ionic video, we talked about what something needs in order to conduct electricity. There are two check boxes that I need to check in order for something to conduct electricity. I need freely moving charged particles. So in order for something to conduct electricity, I need freely moving charged particles. Now, I'm guessing if any of you are like me, you have accidentally stripped the insulating plastic off a pair of headphones or two in your time. Whether you've got them caught in a zipper or a car door or I don't know, I swear, sometimes I look at headphones and they decide to break but you've probably noticed that there is a copper wire running through those headphones. The reason why we use copper is that copper is a very good conductor of electricity. It has those freely moving charged particles. So let's link these guys, particularly malleability and electricity to this metallic lattice. So if you remember, when I drew out an ionic lattice and I moved my thing down from when I'd hit it, I had the differently charged ions, which then repelled. I don't have that here. Because of that C of delocalized electrons, my positively charged cations are able to move. So metals are malleable, they're not brittle. So let me just put my lattice back. So if I smash this with a hammer, my, my cations are able to move relative to each other because of that sea of delocalized electrons. Similar sort of reason why it's able to be stretched into wires. As I heat up this lattice, and stretch it, those electrons, those delocalized electrons are, are able to move with those cations, which leads to there being quite a bit of movement. These guys conduct electricity because look at those electrons, they are by definition delocalized. So delocalized means without a location, which means they're freely moving and they're electrons, so they're charged. Metallic lattices conduct electricity because they have free moving electrons. Now, the generally high melting and boiling points are because of the strength of the electrostatic attraction between those delocalized electrons and those cat metallic cations. Okay, I am now going to talk about two different types of alloy. So let's start, let, let me try and be a bit organized here. So over here, one type of alloy is called an interstitial. Interstitial. So a really good example of this is sterling silver. Now, if you own any silver jewellery or anything like that, you will see stamped on it. I mean, at least in Australia, I think it might be slightly different in other countries. You will see 925 stamped on it. What that means is that it's 92.5% silver. And then it's usually copper, but there can be other things. But for our purposes, let's call it 7.5% copper. So sterling silver is an interstitial alloy. So I am going to use gray for silver and red for copper for reasons that should be obvious if you know what these metals look like. So on a periodic table, you should be able to see that silver ions are quite big in comparison to copper. So.
So here is my silver ions. And remember, silver is a plus one. And then copper, I almost went with blue, which is also a fairly easy get for why I'd go for blue with copper. And let's put in some electrons. Now, I'm not going to bother drawing out all the electrons for this. So because I have those two plus ions in there, they are going to have stronger electrostatic attractions to the, uh, to the delocalized electrons, which is going to decrease the mobility of this lattice. Because those coppers are holding on tighter because they're a different size, this lattice is not going to move as freely as this guy up here. This lattice, because it's all the same ions, all the same shapes and sizes, all the same charges, it's able to move very flexibly with that delocalized electron C. But if I change my shapes, I end up with like, edges and ridges, and it doesn't move as freely. This leads to a harder lattice. So pure silver is really very soft. Like if I had a pure silver earring as opposed to the sterling silver earring that I'm currently wearing, and I slept on it or I accidentally grabbed it with my comb when I was brushing my hair, it would bend that earring rather than tugging on my ear and hurting. So look, even sterling silver, if I push on it, I can change its shape. It is still malleable. It is just less malleable than pure silver. And that makes it more useful to us. Silver retains its attractiveness, it retains its um, resistance to corrosion when it is an alloy, but it is harder, it is less malleable. So let me just clarify. And decreased malleability can actually be a benefit for some, for some purposes. So that is an interstitial alloy. For an interstitial alloy, I need two metals and they have to be roughly the same size. So they, my copper has, ta has taken the place of my silver ions within that lattice. The other, Hang on, hang on, hang on. Do I have my alloys right? Okay, my apologies. I just did some Googling because I realized that I had done um, the wrong name for this. So my apologies. This is a substitution. This is a substitution alloy because my copper ion is substituting for a silver ion. The good news is you guys don't actually need to know these names. You don't need to know substitution and interstitial. You just need to be aware that there are different types of alloy. You do not need to know these names. You, need, you might be asked why we might choose an alloy, and that could be to alter its properties. So to decrease or increase conduct, electrical conductivity, to decrease or increase malleability. So my apologies. Sterling silver is a substitution alloy where some of my silver ions are substituted for copper ions. 
The other type of alloy is an interstitial alloy. And that, for that one, I'm going to talk about steel. So in particular, I'm just going to talk about carbon steel. So in carbon steel, I have my iron ions. And then, so I've got my iron ions with their delocalized electrons and I've been doing delocalized electrons in blue, so I will keep doing them in blue. So I've got my delocalized electrons, but then what I have is within this lattice, I have carbon. So if you've ever heard about how they make samurai swords or how they made samurai swords, they used to take a piece of iron and then hammer it out and fold it over and keep doing that. And they did it without knowing in order to incorporate carbon atoms into the spaces. So stitchel, um, refers to spaces, particularly within the body. And then inter means within. So in an interstitial alloy, I am inserting carbon atoms into gaps within this metallic lattice. And those carbon atoms decrease malleability. And they also decrease electrical conductivity, depending on what it is. In the case of um, carbon steel, inserting those carbon atoms in because it's um, not um, an ion, because it doesn't donate electrons into that delocalized C, we have um, a decrease in malleability. So pure iron, is actually quite soft. It's only once we go through this process of modification that the iron gets hard enough that we can actually use it. Okay, so those are two main types of alloys. Let's go on and let's double check our study guide to make sure we've done everything. So we have talked about a lattice of positive ions and delocalized electrons. Key word here is delocalize. A lot of the time in the IB mark schemes, it will require the use of the word delocalized or freely moving. I like delocalized. I just think it's a nicer word to say. The strength of that metallic bond, that electrostatic attraction, depends on the charge of the ion and the radius of the ion. I didn't really talk about the radius of the ion, because I am going to make a video, maybe later this afternoon, about the strength of an um, the strength of metallic and ionic lattices. So I'll go into more detail there, but I did introduce it here. Alloys usually contain more than one thing, and they have enhanced properties, and that is enhanced with respect to what we're using them for. There isn't, so in some cases, we might want a metal that has a lower melting point. For example, in the old stained glass windows where we've got solder. Solder traditionally is a mixture of lead and some other metals that has a really low melting point. So we've talked about electrical conductivity and malleability. We will talk more about the trends of the melting points in the other video, so I haven't done that here. And we've talked about the properties in terms of those freely moving sea of electrons. That is what we mean by non-directional. The bonding isn't located in one particular space or plane. Because of those freely moving electrons, my um, lattice is able to move and shift. 
When we talk about trends, that is the trends in the melting point. So I have not done that. And I have given you, admittedly, a bit of a mix up to start with. I have given you examples of two major alloys. Most other metals that we use in our everyday lives are also alloys. It's very rare to have pure metal in our lives. So nine carat gold versus 24 carat gold, those different alloys of gold are basically categorized based on the proportion of gold they have within that metallic lattice. So nine carat gold is a lot harder and that is because there is more of those other metallic elements that make a stronger lattice. Okay, that brings us to the end of our discussion about metals. As I've said, there is going to be a, a second video about the strengths of ionic and metallic lattices, but you need to have watched both this video and the ionic lattice video before getting on to that. Have a fantastic rest of your day and I shall see you next time. Bye.